Hi, and welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast for Thursday, June 27th. My name is Nathaniel White Joyle, and today I am joined by Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer at Fairwinds, and by Lou Zeller from the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. So, Lou, will you tell us a little bit about the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League and the work that you guys are doing? Sure. Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League was founded back in 1984 when the people in western North Carolina and southwest Virginia learned about a federal project. The United States Department of Energy had established a uh, crystalline repository project based on the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. Uh, passed in Congress, and the whole objective was to find some place to dump uh, 70,000 uh, tons of high-level radioactive waste. That is the irradiated fuel that comes out of all of the commercial nuclear reactors in, in the country. At this point, there's 104 of them left. Um, but at the time, we were concerned because they were looking at various geological formations in the southern Appalachian regions. Granite rock, for example, is one of the media they considered uh, for drilling a hole down 1,000, 2,000 feet and burying this stuff. Uh, they considered other areas in the country, for example, salt domes in the Mississippi, Texas area. They were looking at rock bodies and geology in Maine and Wisconsin and and like I say, all across the southeast, particularly Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, had some of those sites. And in fact, one of the 12 sites which had gotten preliminary uh, screening, made it through the preliminary screening approval, uh, was about 20 miles from my home in North Carolina. And so that's when I became part of the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League that happened. And I joined it in 1986. And I've been with them ever since. Now, we the project on the uh, high-level nuclear waste dump, you know, evolved over several years. And what happened was that the outcry that we and others raised because of the serious questions, unresolved engineering questions and basic problems that there are with the whole fundamental idea of putting waste material, which is dangerous for a quarter of a million years, in a hole in the ground, ultimately caused uh, Congress to change the law, and uh, that happened in 1987, and that was called the Screw Nevada Bill, uh, which they said, oh, well, you know, there's not so much nuclear waste as we thought there was, so we only need one dump. See, originally they had planned to have one in the east and one in the west. So anyway, that, that of course, fell apart early during the last few years, where Yucca Mountain site in Nevada was also deemed to be unsuitable, so basically they're back to square one, but Blue Ridge... Environmental Defense League got founded, like I say, back in the 1980s because of the threat to the uh, public health, threat to the communities in, uh, in our backyard. Thanks, Lou. So let's shift direction here. Let's talk about the shakeup at the top of the Tennessee Valley Authority and how the merger between Progress and Duke Energy fits into that. And maybe you can fill us in a bit on the response that the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League has had. There's been a new chairman of Tennessee Valley Authority who uh, previously came from Progress. And he drove Progress into the ground uh, by um, allowing Crystal River Unit 3 to, um, to, to sit for four years uh, when it couldn't be repaired. And also pumping a couple billion dollars into Levy County, a... Um, an AP-1000 plan in, in Florida. It was uh, TVA uh, announced back in November last year, 2012, that they had uh, hired William D. Johnson, uh, Bill Johnson, the former chairman and the chief executive officer of Progress Energy uh, to become president and CEO of TVA. This was to be effective January of this year. So. Um, the way that meeting happened, uh, the way that decision was made, is highly questionable to begin with, Arnie. Um, but they hired uh, the former Progress CEO, who was fired by Duke within a matter of hours after the Duke and Progress merger had occurred, um, and uh, without even a formal meeting, without a formal vote. TVA did this. Uh, and hired this man 
uh, using a procedure which is called notational procedure. So in other words, members of the TVA board uh, cast votes without any deliberation or discussion. They voted separately, and according to the TVA statements and, the, and a review by the, their inspector general, uh, they meant that they could not discuss the candidate's qualifications uh, or otherwise deliberate with one another about the selection. Basically, the board hired uh, a pig and a poke and agreed to pay him millions of dollars uh, without even so much as a conversation. So that is questionable there. This is this is one that sent off alarm bells all across uh, uh, the area that, that Blue Ridge works in, which includes you know Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, and uh, and elsewhere. Hang on here, Lou. Um, you, so you're telling me that the guy who drove Progress Energy into the in, into the ditch, who then got a job with Duke that he was thrown out of after he had been on the job for all of about six hours, was hired by Tennessee Valley Authority without deliberation. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I got that clear. But, but the whole, the Duke and Progress um, merger is, 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 is equally uh, suspicious. Uh, because the way it happened, uh, you know, the TV, uh, Duke Energy and, and Progress Energy have uh, created a, this giant uh, investor-owned utility. In fact, it, it is now the largest investor-owned utility on the planet. And that's according to the present CEO, Jim Rogers, of Duke Energy, of the merged corporation. Um, it was a $26 billion merger between these two companies with headquarters in, in North Carolina, but uh, with operations all over the eastern United States. Um, so the merger happened, and with, as you said, within a matter of hours, uh, the man who was supposed to be CEO of that merged company, uh, Bill Johnson, within a matter of hours, he was booted. Um, it was kind of a boardroom coup, I think the Wall Street Journal uh, described it as. Um, and they replaced him with Jim Rogers, who had run Duke Energy uh, before uh, the merger deal. And uh, there was, this was a, a, you know, this was a lot of bitter, um, acrimonious debate, which happened at the time, letters back and forth about bad faith and all in it. And, uh, you know, we had questions about this as well. Many of us in North Carolina that follow uh, the details of Duke Energy and Progress Energy over the years had questions about this and, and raised the issues before the, the State Utilities Commission. Um, the, for example, the Progress uh, board members seem to be uh, very unhappy about it. They said that they would not have voted for the merger of Duke and Progress uh, had they known that uh, the CEO of the former CEO of Duke, Jim Rogers, would remain as CEO of this of this new company. You know, frankly, I, I think the uh, uh, the Progress, even though they lost their their head, um, still came out pretty damn good. They uh, uh, th their company was was in the ditch. You know, the Crystal River was uh, uh, was falling apart or had fallen apart. Levy County is never going to get built, and they've got a couple billion sunk into it. And the Brunswick plant, which they had uh, also been operating, had uh, had poor operating ratings. So um, here's a company that was in the ditch, and um, and uh, and Duke uh, pulled them out. Um, so um, while it, the, the board of progress may be upset. You know, frankly, I think uh, they didn't have much of a bargaining position here. Well, it may be crocodile tears, you know, because Bill, uh, you know, Johnson, um, Bill Johnson got a sweetheart deal. Uh, his his uh, severance package, I read, is probably in order in the, in the area of forty four million bucks, um, which includes a payment of. One and a half million. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off, Luke. Did you say forty-four million dollars? Yeah, severance packages. And Luke, this, this guy worked six hours. It includes a payment of up to one point five million dollars, but on the condition he'd not say anything bad about Duke Energy, the new merger, or the old Duke. 
Okay, well, you know, there it is. And so uh, this this all happened in, uh, you know, the merger and the ouster. That's all, you know, we're in mid-2012. And then so a few months later, uh, Bill Johnson shows up and uh, to Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, TVA uh, headquarters as their new boss. And um, it's with with similar kind of shenanigans, um, uh, putting him in, in and you know you pointed out quite correctly you know there are good there are serious matters which should have been raised about uh, Bill Johnson's uh, tenure as CEO of Progress Energy. Apparently they didn't bother uh, Duke Energy during the merger. Uh, in other words, they did appoint him, but then they booted him. What is going on here? What we see is that you know this um, Jim Rogers is is a pretty aggressive um, CEO. He started out what twenty years ago or so with uh, uh, Public Service Indiana in 1988, I think it was, beginning of, uh, and has has continued to rise to the top as CEO as utilities merged. Uh, Public Service uh, Indiana merged with Cincinnati Gas and Electric. Uh, that formed Synergy. Synergy is acquired by Duke Energy in 94. Uh, Rogers became CEO of uh, Duke in 2006. And um, so there is an aggressive move um, on the part of these captains of industry to consolidate and merge. And I think they're licking their chops over you know, picking up the nation's largest public utility, and that would be TVA. It's inescapable. I mean, it, you know, when, when Bill Johnson was put in as head of TVA, I tell you what, all the flash and arrow signs that I could imagine were, were um, and alarm buzzers were going off because we said, what the heck is going on here? Is Bill Johnson, you know, that big a catch where they'd want to put him in without reviewing it? Um, his ouster from Duke, uh, the Duke, uh, the new combined Duke Progress Energy, uh, was suspicious enough. But the sweetheart package that he got out of that, and then his uh, accession uh, to TVA, is very suspicious. In other words, who is in the best position now to take over TVA? If indeed it goes on the chopping block, because the president, in his uh, 2014 budget has ordered a review um, of the sale of TVA to private interests. Even though TVA operates solely for income from ratepayers, it has a debt of $25 billion, certainly, but the debt's not backed by the federal government. In other words, taxpayers are not liable for it, um, but it is included in the overall federal debt total. So does the sale of the utility eliminate $25 billion worth of red ink with the stroke of a pen for the federal government? Is that in the interest of the United States to do that at the cost of uh, jettisoning an agency like TVA, which is, um, despite some of the mistakes it has made, still, I think, a good example of uh, a public utility which did very many good things in its early years in particular. And I mentioned those uh, in terms of flood control and improvement of the economy in the, uh, in the Tennessee Valley area. So TVA has been spending money like a drunken sailor on, on building new nuclear plants. And I, and I use new in quotes because what they've done is they've gone out and they've uh, found um, old nuclear plants that have been, uh, been, been left to, um, to sit and rust. And they're uh, trying to bring them back to life. Watts Bar is one and Belafonte is another. And we did a... a, a big story last year on Belafonte, and, um, and listeners might want to go back and check that out. But here's a plant that uh, um, was shut down uh, when it was 80 plus percent built. It was put in mothballs uh, for 20 years, and then it was cannibalized. And when they cannibalized it, the NRC uh, terminated their license. And two years later, after it was cannibalized, they went back and they said, whoops, we made a mistake, we want our license back. And we don't want to go through the hearing process. And the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission agreed with the uh, dissenting vote of, um, of a member of the commission called Yasko, who ultimately became chairman. So 
so Belafonte uh, had life breathed back into it, but it also had a low ball estimate given to the, the board of directors at TVA that they could do it for one or two billion. Now, in fact, it's probably up at six billion to seven billion to finish Belafonte. And the board, once again, is having second thoughts and has mothballed Belafonte again. They've got a, a hundred people there uh, just basically sweeping the floors and keeping the rats from eating the wires. Um, same thing happened at Watts Bar. Watts Bar started with a $2 billion estimate, and now it's pushing five or six, and it's not done yet. So TVA's got this huge debt it's incurred by building new old nuclear power plants that were canceled years before. Um, I guess it's that uh, that nuclear liability that's pushing TVA pretty close to its debt limit. I think so too. I think uh, you know that's a good example. You know they started Belfont and then they they abandoned it, um, mothballed it basically like you say and uh, they ran into trouble when they were trying to license two additional reactors of the new uh, Westinghouse AP-1000 reactor. They were supposed to be a Belfont 3 and 4, um, but uh, they ran into some problems. I think we raised some uh, serious uh, arguments against what they were doing there in its licensing procedure. Partly what happened, they've uh, kind of retrenched and gone back to trying to get licensed, which they have uh, gotten approval from NRC, to do is to, um, is to build unit one of that old reactor design, which they had already cannibalized and removed much of the piping and, and whatnot and uh, for other purposes. Um, but Belfont is uh, predicated on uh, construction, finishing construction of Watts Bar Nuclear, which is just upstream on the Tennessee River on the, ten on the Tennessee side. Belfont One <laughs> would be constructed with funds which they would get from selling Watts Bar Nuclear Unit Two. It's all out there in the public record. It's on the website. You can read it, and I'd be happy to talk further about it. But yeah, it, you know there is some funny business going on there. And connecting the dots again, we see two of the nation's largest, most aggressive investor-owned utilities involved in these merger shenanigans, the end result of which is an ousted CEO soon becomes chief of the nation's largest public utility, which may now be put on the auction block. So, Lou, can you tell me how this is going to affect the rate payers? Well, um, there is a rate hike hearing coming up uh, for Duke Energy, uh, the third uh, rate hike before the North Carolina Utilities Commission since 2009 which would boost average residential rates by 13.9% and uh, small business rates up to 10.7%. Um, these rates would be 30% higher than they were in 2009. So here's Duke Energy, now Duke Progress Energy, um, still uh, boosting rates here. And there's a hearing coming up. Um, an evidentiary hearing coming up on July the 8th in Raleigh. And uh, we and other groups um, in, in the Carolinas are, are challenging that rate hike. 30% over four years couldn't in the middle take, of a recession. Couldn't, couldn't they take that from the $44 million they just gave to the CEO? I mean, it's really outrageous what's going on here. A protected monopoly with captured rate payers, Duke seeking guaranteed minimum profits, of 11.25 percent, 11 point, 11 and a quarter percent, which way exceeds market level returns. My God, that's amazing. The, the um, so the hearing is coming up in North Carolina, and it's on the seventh. Did I hear you say? It is on the eighth of July, which is a Monday. We'll look forward to hearing your melodious voice there, uh, uh, protecting the ratepayers of. North Carolina. On the on the other issue, that of the TVA ratepayers, if um, if TVA were to be sold, uh, and they they would be uh, less protected than they are now. So it's likely that their rates would go up too. I would. Uh, that would be my guess as well. Uh, TVA has its own board of directors. It's a little bit different than the corporate structure of the investor-owned utilities. I was at the Duke energy uh, shareholders meeting earlier this year. It was my first Duke Energy 
shareholder meeting, and I came out of there shaking my head there because it seemed like a dictatorship. I mean, uh, Jim Rogers was in total control, and even the people that had stock, voting uh, stock, and could participate in the meeting basically treated like mushrooms. I mean, there was all the business was handled cut and dried, and uh, before he even opened the floor to any questions from from uh, investors. I mean, that's not a public hearing. That's a that's a Securities Exchange Commission governed type meeting. TVA's board operates a little differently than that. It is more open to the public. I've been to TVA board meetings, and they're held in various places or in their service area. Basically, a public hearing, which is held at every uh, board meeting, usually before the meeting starts of TVA. The end result may not be much different, but <laughs> it seems like it. And I know a lot of folks in, uh, that have been dealing with TVA over the years think that TVA doesn't follow any rules but its own rules. But there is, there is quite a difference in the atmosphere, certainly. And I think you've seen differences in the results, too, because I think if the, the educational efforts of people in the grassroots level in Tennessee Valley Authority's service area or any indication, you know, the company is not proceeding with plans to build Belfont 3 and 4. Um, it is it's a major hawk, but it's a different corporate culture. It certainly is. Um, but be that as it may, the, you know, TVA is this, uh, somehow a desirable property to um, some kind of private entity such as investor-owned utility, and if it's not Duke in progress, then who else would have the kind of bucks necessary? What makes TVA attractive is they have a lot of customers, and you know, and they're, they're captured customers too. It's not like a, a grocery store where you can pick, if you don't like one grocery store, you can move to another. So th that's why Duke bought progress, was to get the customers. And the same thing could easily be said for, you know, buying TVA. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that Progress, Progress Duke and TVA have uh, almost every ice containment plant in the country. Um, the ice containment, in my opinion, is the second most dangerous containment we've got in the country. The, uh, the first is the, the BWR uh, Mark I containment like Fukushima Daiichi. And we've got 23 of those. And, you know, I'm on record as saying that those plants should be shut down because that containment design is just not safe. But the, the second worst design are these ice containments. And uh, TVA's got a couple and, uh, and Duke's got a couple. And I think between them, they come up with seven out of the nine ice containments are owned right there in the, uh, in the southeast. What are you guys doing about the ice containments? Well, can you first fill us in on, on what the ice containments are? Yeah, that's a good idea. It is not a giant igloo made of ice. What, what it is is it's, it's a, a nuclear containment is, uh, is concrete with a steel liner. But this ice containment is much smaller than normal nuclear containments. And what they did to drop the pressure in the reactor is that they, uh, after an accident, is that they run the steam through ice that's uh, attached to the sides of the containment. And the ice melts and it cools the steam so that the pressure shock to the containment is, is lower. Now anybody who's put ice in your ice box for 40 years realizes that it's not there when you go to look for it. Um, and these containments are designed to hold ice for 40 years. Ice sublimates, which means it just disappears right into the air over time. So the yeah, ice containments over the years have had all sorts of problems. The ice sticks together, the ice disappears. There's all sorts of technical um, fixes that are designed to keep the ice in, in, um, in good working order. It's never been tried, thank God. There's never been an accident to see if it would work. But uh, to my mind, it's, um, it's way too complicated and way too small. If the ice doesn't work, the containment's too small to handle the pressure shock. And that's why they're so dangerous. Yeah, that's why they're so dangerous. And uh, so anyway, there's a couple that TVA owns, and there's a bunch that, that Duke owns, and uh, they're essentially uh, all in that same part of the country. That's right. It's a complicated system you just described. I mean, 2,000 baskets of ice uh, with, with doors and channels which get stuck, settling of the structures and whatnot, and 
and ice jamming, you know, various parts of the machinery. But this is all done, this was done in, as a cost-saving measure because concrete and steel are expensive to construct, and so they got away with a much lower strength containment building, that dome-shaped building that you see over the reactors. And so it's got half of the strength it would need to withstand um, a typical pressure rise in a plausible accident. Uh, and this, this comes from uh, outfits such as Sandia National Laboratories. They did a study on ice condensers years ago. And uh, so there is a fundamental problem with this ice condenser technology. And you're right, there are two of them at um, Catawba Nuclear Power Station, operated by Duke in South Carolina. There are two of them operating at McGuire in North Carolina, also run by Duke. Uh, there are two operating at Sequoia Nuclear Station, which is in Soddy Daisy, Tennessee, just north of uh, Chattanooga. Uh, there's one at Watts Bar, and there's one under construction. So there's a, you know, potential, well, obviously there's a construction liability with, with uh, Watts Bar, but on top of that, we've got the, uh, uh, the second worst containment in the country. Essentially, all our eggs are in one basket down in the southeast because that's where these containments uh, proliferate. Uh, there, there is two up at uh, D.C. Cook uh, in, the, in the Midwest as well. But like I said, seven, seven out of the nine or eight out of the ten, depending if you count Watts Bar, are, are in there. So uh, what's going on with Sequoia and the, uh, and the ice containment issue? Well, a, f a few months ago, um, Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League uh, filed an intervention with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because um, TVA had submitted an application to renew the license of the Sequoia nuclear power plant reactors. And so we raised a series of safety questions, a series of environmental questions, having to do with the extension of the reactor license beyond the 40-year period for uh, 20 additional years, which would mean through uh, 2041. License renewals are tightly constricted in terms of what you may consider, but I think we have eight strong arguments. Some of them were uh, buttressed by your expert testimony, Arnie, and so those are outstanding. Uh, and in fact, we had the possibility of a of oral arguments to happen this week. Uh, this is the week of uh, June the 26th, and uh, which may not happen after all. But in other words, we're waiting for the for the shoe to drop. We've heard back from TVA, we've heard back from Nuclear Regulatory Commission's staff attorneys um, on these arguments. But I hope some of these arguments survive uh, because there are questions which are fundamental to the operation of the power station itself based on the ice condenser containment. And then there are other issues which I think also augur uh, for admission of the arguments and, uh, and becoming a party to intervention um, in the license, similar to what we've done before. Can we talk a little bit more about what we might be seeing going forward with the public health issues? The new designs are really no safer than the old designs. They're just new. Uh, they have a few less pumps, a little bit less plumbing, but they haven't solved the basic problem of that, that we saw led to the meltdown at, um, at Fukushima or uh, Chernobyl um, or Three Mile Island. They haven't altered nuclear physics to the point where these reactor designs are any safer than the old ones. And in fact, they introduce some fundamental problems which are not present in the earlier reactors, since they rely on things which I believe they should not rely on. For example, I guess gravity is more reliable than an electric pump in order to supply water to a reactor which is in a failure mode. However, if you put that water above a reactor, now you're talking about 3,000 tons of water above a reactor, which itself weighs only about 400 tons. So you're talking about a huge weight on the top of this power plant so that when they open a valve, that the water will flow downwards according to gravity. However, you're building these reactors in earthquake-prone areas, 
South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and elsewhere. And um, to put that kind of weight creates an inherent instability. And RC's experts have also identified problems with the containment structures of the Westinghouse AP-1000. Their major considerations also have to do with the, with the environmental issues. The, the generic environmental impact statement, which serves uh, for license renewals, um, has to be supplemented. But what we're seeing is that there are low, from low dose exposures that there are disproportionately affected individuals and a higher level of morbidity and mortality, that is death and disease, in the areas around the Sequoia reactor, for example. So we've looked at public health statistics there and are continuing to do those studies. You've got flooding issues at Sequoia as a result of the failure of upstream dams. They've got uh, problems of uh, the long-term storage of irradiated nuclear fuel, the waste confidence decision, I think, should stop this re license renewal in its tracks. Um, we're talking about the uh, possibility of plutonium fuel use. This is a whole other issue, but Sequoia Nuclear is and TVA um, are included in the United States Department of Energy's surplus plutonium disposition statement, uh, which is still to be ultimately decided. So they list Sequoia as one of the reactors that could use this weapons-grade plutonium downblended with uranium into a so-called mixed oxide fuel. So that's an outstanding question. Plutonium fuel introduces new risks in what we've already described as one of the most problematic reactor designs. Plutonium fuel would cause greater embrittlement. It would if, it was, if there was an accident or a meltdown, there would be greater uh, amount of radiation, more dangerous types of radiation, for example, the actinides, uh, which we include and add to the uh, public health impact from the escaping radioactive poisons. Um, and I already mentioned about the aging management plans, the critical components of the ice condenser containment. Uh, the severe ability to withstand severe accidents and the mismanagement of TVA's whistleblower complaints, long-standing, going back decades. I think you know all augur for uh, a denial of the of an extended license for Sequoia, and some of these considerations are uh, replicated. Uh, for example, the ice condenser containment issues at um, at the Catawba station in South Carolina, at the McGuire station in North Carolina, as well as Watts Bar. We look at the TVA culture and three of the six worst nuclear reactors in the country as far as whistleblower complaints are Tennessee Valley Authority reactors. Um, number one on the list is San Onofre which shut down already. Uh, when you take that off it's uh, there, there are three out of the top five nuclear plants in the country are Tennessee Valley Authority as far as whistleblower complaints. So we have a corporate culture problem at TVA at the worker bee level, and we've got a, an out of control spending like a drunken sailor board at TVA that's uh, encouraging more nuclear plants in a culture that in fact is corrupted. Agreed. Agreed. This is a very bad situation. And um, uh, I just wish that, you know, TVA would listen to the its better angels and go back doing what it did well from the beginning, which is uh, flood control and um, alternative renewable energy. They are doing some of that, um, and I think they should do more of it. Of course, that goes for the industrial utilities as well, but TVA could be the draft horse for the green energy revolution if they would just wake up and smell the coffee. And on that note, we're going to wrap things up. So, Lou, thank you very much for joining us today. Arnie, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Matt. All right, thank you both. I enjoyed it. This podcast has been a production of Fairwinds Energy Education. 